Welcome back. Any questions so far about like syllabus stuff? Those of you who are new, anybody want a paper syllabus? There's a digital one online as well. Paper? Raise your hand if you want a paper. Even if you were here before, if you want another one, maybe, you know, one for the home, one for the office. Probably, yeah. If you lost the first one, chances are good you lose the second one. Just stick with the digital version, right? Anybody else? Syllabus, syllabus, syllabus. Okay. I won't go over it. There is a syllabus quiz. If you have any questions about the syllabus quiz, let me know. Is it Shaheen? Shaheen, welcome back. All right. So, um, last time... Went around, I got everybody's name, I asked you some questions, I kind of poked at you a little bit. It was fun? I don't know, what do you guys think? Was it, was it fun? Was it, somebody, somebody approached me after the class and said, like, is this pretty standard? Like, is it, there going to be this much back and forth dialogue? And I was like, oh, I, like I hope so. This, it, yesterday, not yesterday, Tuesday, was definitely tilted a little more in this direction than our normal meetings will be. There might be a little more in, in this direction. But I'd like to have that sort of dialogue. One difference that I would like to have is see if we could focus it, because it was a little bit, while it was fun, and we were following ideas wherever they led, and some of this had to do with that I was forcing everybody to talk, even if they didn't want to. But there was a little bit of kind of like, Whoa, let's go talk about this, Whoa, oh, this idea. Whoa. Have you ever had a conversation like that where you're trying to talk to somebody about something, and they keep like, Whoa, and you're like, get back here, we're talking about this thing. One sustained conversation about one idea at a time. <laughs> Please, let's slow it down. This is like a big mark of philosophy. It's a slowing down of your thought process so that you can become a little more careful in your thought process. Philosophy is very slow. This is why we're still in conversation with things that were happening like 2,500 years ago, right? That's how slow the conversation is. We still haven't stopped talking to the folks at the very beginning. And that's what, that's what this class is all about. That's, in fact, that's what today's class meeting is all about. We're going to go like all the way back to the very, very beginning. Um, we talked last time about this question, and in, I tried to weave it into and cram it into the end of our little free-for-all conversation. Um, that sounded that sounded like I wasn't impressed with it, our little free-for-all conversation. It was good. It was good for what it was. Um, this question about, like, well, why should we study ancient philosophy? I, I kind of sketched out a couple of possible answers. One if you'll recall, was just a standard history of ideas sort of answer. Like, if we want to know where we are, if we want to understand who we are, we need to understand, like, where we came from as a culture. And this is, like, the moment where I think a lot of folks will be like, what culture, man? Like, white European culture? Like, male chauvinist culture? And I'd be like, yeah, that's, the cult. that's like, where we come from. A lot of us do come from, even those of us who would challenge that sort of uh, colonialist narrative. Like, you can't deny that Western colonialism has been a really, really big part of world history and hugely influential. So, like, we need to pay attention to it, even if we want to critique it, perhaps especially if we want to critique it. Um, then there was the second answer, which is that, like, these texts are not part of the philosophical, Western philosophical canon just because, like, it wasn't arbitrary. They're actually, like, really good stuff that stood the test of time. And the questions that they're engaging are timeless questions. They haven't gone away. We're still asking them. We're still answering them in much the same way that the ancient philosophers did. So uh, we want to understand it in that way as well. What I didn't really get around to was this third idea about, like, what it means to engage philosophically with really, really old texts. Um, you guys know this movie, Goodwill Hunting? Yeah. Okay. Um, there's a scene in that where the late Robin Williams is talking to Matt Damon, and he asks Matt Damon, Will Hunting, he says, Will, do you have a soulmate? And um, Will's like, I got, I got plenty. And he starts rattling off a list of like, people who, who kind of like touch him, not like physically, spiritually, <laughs> folks who spiritually touch him. And, it, and his list is like John Locke, Nietzsche, Kant, Pope, O'Connor, <clears throat> dead people, right? A whole bunch of dead people. And Robin Williams' character says like, yeah, but they're, they're dead. Like you're not going to have a real conversation with them. That's an interesting little moment right there because I think that's not entirely true. 
There's a way of reading this, this stuff charitably that does make it come alive. We're talking about having a conversation, like a genuine conversation with somebody where I'm trying to see where they're coming from. What the 20th century philosopher Hans Georg Gadamer will call a fusion of horizons. This kind of moment where somebody else is talking about something and I try to take up their perspective and see it how they're describing it. See what it is that they're talking about and think with them. This is like a really impressive moment. We might even say something like this is one of the most precious of human experiences. This is, this is the moment when we really connect with people. Um, I don't know if you've ever had like these long, you know, perhaps fueled by some controlled substance, like long conversations till like 3 a.m. with somebody you stayed up in the dorm and you talked to, like these are your friends, right? The people that you have those conversations with. These are the people who are kind of important in your life. This is how you really interact. This is like the best way to interact with people. There are other ways as well. You can play tennis with them. You can have sex with them. They're all, but this is like there's something uniquely human about that trying to share perspectives and see where the other person's coming from. And when you actually do engage that, and it's not just a passivity where you're just like, I'm just going to see it the way that Plato says it. In order to like, understand it, you need to kind of push back a little bit. There needs to be a critique. There needs to be a like, he says this, but like, how could that be? And then you're coming back, oh, I, all right, I see how we would, oh, oh, and it's a back and forth. And this is how it becomes a conversation. This is how it becomes alive. This is how your philosophical community, your, your community of interlocutors becomes bigger, not just the people in your classroom, Certainly not just the people, like we have this problem, it's a contemporary social problem, right? That we have little bubbles. It's almost exacerbated by, by the way that we technologically mediate our, our social sphere. The, the, a whole bunch of eyes just glaze, does nobody, nobody care about? Like, are you familiar with this? That we, we work ourselves into bubbles where the only ideas we ever hear are the ones that we like. And somebody says something that we disagree with and we're like, you're out of the bubble. And they join their own bubble. And then it's just like, we're all over here like, what's wrong with them? They're crazy. Blah, 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 blah. Obviously, blah, blah. And they're all over here like, obviously, they're fucking idiots over here. And blah, blah, blah. So like, that's a problem. We need to like, have those conversations be real and engaging and not just expanded to everybody in our community, but expanded to people who are outside of our community, expanded to people who are dead. Long, long time ago. This is a 2,500-year-long conversation, and it's still going on. And in order to really get what philosophy is all about, in order to get as much as you can out of this sort of course, it needs to be more than just stamp collecting for you. It needs to be more than, like, Thales said this, and Anaximander said this, and Anaximenes said this, and the Pythagoreans say this. this is, these are all their positions. That's not philosophy. Philosophy is not just knowing what people said. That's philology. That's... Just the study of what people said. Philosophy is the love of wisdom. There's an engagement there, right? It's not just that I know what they said, it's that I've struck up a conversation with them. Okay. That's the introduction to the class that we took 50 minutes to kind of sort of sketch out on Tuesday. And hopefully I just kind of compressed into a little diamond for us just now. Does that sound about right? Does that sound like the sort of thing, like, oh, I'll spend a semester doing that. Okay. I am not a cartographer. Oh, yes, okay, um, so, uh, not to scale, okay. Um, that's the, Medi the general Mediterranean, right? Okay. As like we all, like, uh, oh, that's what he's talking about. Thanks for the person who recognized Italy right off the bat. That's where I say, you got to start with the boot, right? You got to start with the boot. Tons of islands out here. Just, just lousy with islands. Which is a big part of like how Greek civilization began. Um, this, is, this is geographically what we're talking about. It's particularly important for when we're talking about the pre-Socratic philosophers. Pre-Socratic philosophers, what do we mean by that? Well, the ones who came before Socrates. And um, in reading Baird, 
my hope is that like you got a sense of that there's some ambivalence I think amongst most ancient philosophers about this term pre-Socratic. It's almost like not fair to the pre-Socratic philosophers that were like, oh, what do they all have in common? Well, they're all before Socrates. It's just, like if, it, imagine if your parents talked about you as, anybody have an older sibling or a younger sibling or something like that? Yeah, imagine if you were just like your sibling's brother or sister, right? Some of us might have experienced it, like coming up through school and, oh, yeah, that's Adam's sister. My sister hated that shit. Um, so yeah, it's almost not really fair to the pre-Socratic philosophers. There's something genuine going on there. But I'll also say that once we hit, like you'll, hopefully you'll notice, once we get to Socrates, there's going to be a noticeable shift, a kind of a quantum leap forward where like, we're doing something perhaps qualitatively different. At the very least, like, it's almost like we're in the early stages of philosophy. It's starting to come together with the pre-Socratics. By the time it's hit Socrates, it's definitely going. This question about like who the first philosopher is is a really weird and delicate question. It's uh, the sort of thing that, uh, first of all, we don't we don't know who all was saying what, and like no matter who you pick as like oh, I think that person's the first philosopher. Somebody's gonna be like, well, somebody came before, or well, I don't know if it was quite philosophy at that point yet. Part of what we need to answer this is to have some idea of what a philosopher is and what philosophy is. We talked about this a little bit at our last meeting too. That it's, we had all kinds of answers, but one thing that we stuck on that at least seems etymologically resonant is this idea, it's the love of wisdom. For the Greeks, and I think for the, this story of Western philosophical thought and the story of its beginnings, I think a lot of times this gets cashed out as a movement from mythos to logos. Mythos to logos. With mythos is just it's the it's the dominant myth of the day, right? It's uh, it's what's it, anybody do any studying in classics or ancient history? Like no, oh okay, theogony. No, nobody knows theogony. Okay. Are you familiar with Greek mythology? All right, so that's this. That's that like it's all the stories that everybody is telling. The ones about like Zeus who overthrew his father, Kronos, and Kronos uh, in, in the, the Clash of the Titans, and Kronos overthrew his father, Uranos, by, um, yeah, he cut off his testicles with a scythe and threw them into the ocean. What a jerk. <laughs> he did that to his own father. Oh, my gosh. Um, but to be fair, his father was horrible. Tried to eat everybody, and it was... So anyway, so that's the, that's the mythos, and we're moving into logos, which is something else. Like, whole books have been written about, like, what do the Greeks mean by logos? We see some of its sense in the, the echoes that work its way into our language now. Would, like, what is logos? What does it remind you of? Logic. Logic, yeah, obviously. So logic is, yeah, so sometimes um, Socrates will talk about, uh, or Plato will talk about logos in the sense of an account. He wants it to be like a telling. This also comes from uh, the root legain. Logos and legain kind of bring a whole bunch of really interesting ideas together. Logos is frequently used to talk about speech. That's this kind of the same idea as an account. And the root legain comes from this, uh, we see a lot of uses of it kind of being to gather things up and put them into an order. Like uh, to gather up sticks for firewood and put all the small ones together and the medium ones together and the bigger ones together. That would be to like go legain some sticks and be like, okay, I get them and then I order them. And this is kind of this kind of uh, this provides some provocative ideas about what we're doing when we use language, when we give an account, right? You're gathering things together, you're organizing them, and you're kind of like presenting them in an easy to use way. So it's this movement from mythos to logos. What is the mythos? You can learn a lot about a people by looking at their gods. Tell me about the Greek gods, those of you who know a little something about the Greek gods. Either you read, I don't know, maybe you read the Iliad, maybe you read Theogony. Yeah. They're really human. They're awfully human, right? Like yeah. They make a lot of mistakes. They do make a lot of mistakes. A lot of things. Then they're petty, right? They're petty. They're, yeah. Anything else, O'Neill? Let's try this real quick. O'Neill, catch the microphone. Oh. 
Okay. All right. I Say it again. think they represent the different parts of humans, like emotions and uh, mental states, basically that make up humans as a whole. Okay. Yeah, I like that too. There's a, yeah, there, and this kind of gets at this idea that Omar was getting at too, that there's a kind of a, a humanness to them, right? You can just hold on to it, put it down, and we'll pass it to whoever else wants to talk next, who's in the back. Um, yeah, petty, awfully human, kind of capricious, right? How predictable are humans? Relatively. Very animal. Yeah, it depends, it depends on like your major, I suppose, right? All the psychologists are like, pretty predictable, I hope. All of the performing artists are like, completely unpredictable. <laughs> <laughs> Out comes the glitter. <laughs> I should have had glitter in my pocket, that would have been great. Then you would have been cleaned up for weeks. Yeah, that's true. Um, this says an awful lot about somebody's worldview. That like, so like, why do things happen? Why does the sun go across the sky? Why do the stars move the way that they move? Why was there an earthquake? Why was there a flood? Why did a plague come and wipe things out? Because the gods made it happen. And what about the gods? They're petty. They're capricious. Who knows what they're going to do? There's a kind of a mysteriousness about this. And if you can imagine living in, I don't know, 600 B.C. Greece... And like you're kind of humming along, you're like, oh, this is good. like the sun goes up, the sun goes down, there's a nice regularity to it. Holy shit, an eclipse. Oh my God, what's happening? Or, oh my God, all the crops just failed. We have no idea why. Oh, it's because this guy was rude towards the gods. That's what it was. Ostracize him. Ah, and then the crops came back next year. We did the right thing. All right, good. All right. So this is the way that we're thinking through things, and it's through a kind of a popular storytelling that, that arises organically. People start telling stories. There are crossover characters. It's like one big, huge fan fiction orgy, and then he, he puts it all together in one book, and that kind of becomes like, that's, that's what the gods are like. Moving away from that kind of storytelling to a logos is something that's, yeah, it's kind of... That line gets blurry. I'm not sure, like, why does the sun go across the sky like that? Because Apollo drives it in his chariot. There. I gave a logos, right? I gave an account of what's happening. Why was there an eclipse? Because Apollo was angry. Where does the sun go? When it, like, over there in the west. Like, yeah. I'm giving an account, right? So it's not clear that we're, like, mythos is completely divorced from the Logos. But notice what happens when we start getting into these early pre-Socratic philosophers. Any questions so far with where we are? Okay. Where we are. Huh. We're here. Uh, that's a little off. We're here. Yeah. Is red an okay choice here? Can, I, can folks in the back read this? What about, can we get it? Is it showing up on the... Yeah, that's readable. Okay, good. Um, <coughs> the Milesians, so-called because they were from the city of Miletus. We're starting at about 600 BC, BCE, however, like sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll interchange between the two. But 600 years before year zero, in the city of Miletus, we have something that kind of pops up. And it's three philosophers. At the very least, they have this in common. They're all from the same city. And they all know each other, and they're all talking to one another. There's a little bit of overlap. The first one is Thales. He's the older fellow. And then after Thales comes Anaximander. And then after Anaximander, Anaximenes. They're weird names. You'll have to do a little bit of work to remember them.
Let's start with Thales, because he came first. Thales was... A big deal, actually. Thales was one of known all over, like the, like all of the Greek territories, as one of the seven sages, like seven wise people that occasionally would all come together and meet to kind of talk, you know, interpolitical sort of affairs, right? If there's some talk of like what's going on here, maybe uh, the Persians are trying to invade from the east. Let's all get together and talk about it. One of the big guys was Thales. He was. A statesman. He was a military strategist. Um, did, did we get the fragment in our reading about how there was like a river and there, everyone was like, how's the army going to cross the river? And he like brilliantly says like, well, let's go right up to the edge of the river, dig a trench behind us, almost complete it, and then connect the two and shut off the first row. We basically will just like, we'll move the river behind us and that's how we'll cross it. And everyone's like, wow, that's amazing, Thales. Really cool. Hardly enough to call him a philosopher yet, though. I don't know. I'm not, not sure if that, that'll do it. Um, he also was one of the first, I don't know if the first, but one of the first recorded people to allegedly predict an eclipse, a solar eclipse. So you can imagine how this might be the sort of thing where if the prevalent story is like because Apollo's angry or Zeus is angry or like there's feuding between the gods or somebody made the gods upset, and suddenly Thales is able to predict when this is going to happen, people are going to be like, whoa, what just happened? And he was quite clear about it, about how he did it. He said, I did it by observing all of the patterns and reading through the histories of when all the eclipses were and trying to find some sort of pattern that would make a prediction. He was pretty clear about it. He also did the same thing with a, um, uh, there was a, he predicted that there was going to be a really big olive crop one year and nobody else really thought that it was going to happen or had any reason to suspect that the olive crop was going to be really, really big. So way in advance, he buys up all of the presses. And when there is a big olive crop and everybody wants to take their olives, like olives all by themselves don't last all that long. But olive oil, very, very useful, easy to transport. So when they brought all their olives to press to make into olive oil, Thales was there, the only person who was in control of the presses. And he charged exorbitant feeds and made tons and tons of money not because he wanted the money, but because he wanted to prove to everybody else that if a philosopher wants to make lots of money, they totally can. It's just not the sort of thing that they're interested in. It's just kind of like a demonstration. Be like, I could do this if I wanted to. I could make lots and lots of money. But that's, that's not the best use of my talents. That's not the best application of wisdom. If we want to, and for a lot of our pre-Socratics, we're going to be able to do this. We're going to kind of like cliff note, summarize them in a really sort of a violent way with just like one little nugget, one little phrase. And for almost all of them, there's going to be this idea of everything is. Like we can think of a lot of the, the pre-Socratics as their positions being some kind of elaboration on this fragmentary sentence, everything is. For Thales, it's everything is water. Before we talk about like, why Thales thought that everything was water and why we would even talk about such a ridiculous idea, let's talk about that everything is part. Most of the pre-Socratic philosophers are after what the Greeks called an arche. Where do you recognize this word from? Architecture. Architecture, right? So what does it mean? What does arche mean? Arche structure. structure, yeah, structure. Mm, yeah, now, then yeah, what is, yeah, what does this word mean? You might be sitting there like, I don't know, Rosenfeld, tell me. You're the teacher. What it means is, or, and there's some debate, like there are like, whole books on like, what exactly the pre-Socratic notion of RK was. If we can think of it as a foundation, as a fundamental principle, a fundamental organizing principle. In fact, I like that. Let's start with that. A fundamental organizing principle.
And in searching for this, one of the things that we're kind of tacitly articulating is that I think we can figure the world out. I think the world makes sense. I think it's not just random, capricious acts of gods. I think if we pay, enough clo uh, if we pay close enough attention and if we're sufficiently rigorous in our inquiry, we can figure out what the fundamental organizing principles of the cosmos are. We can figure out everything. Everything can make sense if we just figure out what its structure is, if we just figure out like, what the basic building blocks of reality are all about. That's an interesting move, and we can see how it's part of this shift from mythos to logos. Not just storytelling anymore. We're trying to crack the code. We're trying to render nature intelligible. We're trying to like, strike up a conversation with nature itself. In fact, we might look at some of this, this thinking about like, fundamental organizing principles of, um, of the cosmos, and especially look at the way that the Milesians do it. We might think to ourselves, that looks a little bit more like science than philosophy. We'll talk about that in just a second. But first... Thales, and this idea that everything is water. Why would anybody think that everything is water? Because there's so much. Because there's a, yeah, there's a lot of it. <laughs> it comes down as rain. It comes out of the sky. You dig down underneath the ground, especially if you live in Miletus, which is on the coast. You dig down far enough, like, oh, it's under the ground. It comes out of the sky. It's under the ground. It's running all over the top of the ground. Yeah. Oh, yeah, water flows, right? And it changes, it, mo like it, it takes the shape of its container. Water could, if you were looking for like one thing to say, everything's made out of this, it should probably be something that's like a little, little flowy, right? <laughs> something that can turn into lots of different things. And, yeah, there's something almost alive to it. Lao Tzu says this, one of Thales' contemporaries, like all the way, like far, far away, they're not talking to each other at all. Nobody... Nobody in East Asia is going to be talking to anybody here in Asia Minor for a long, long time. But Lao Tzu is saying the same sorts of things about like the Tao is like it's, it's in the movement of water, right? Yeah. And Bruce Lee talks about this too. Be like water. Yeah. Um, I'm assuming, I'm not, I'm assuming, like they feel thirst and the sensation of thirst is like one of the strongest, like you just want water so badly. Yeah, it's really intense. More intense than hunger too. Yeah. yeah. And if you don't get it, you, yeah, you cease to exist as a person, right? Like, you die. Humans are, now we know, what is the, it's like 70%? Like, a, a big, per, like, we're a lot of water. It's enough that, like, you don't want to go inside a microwave. It's all over the, it's all over the planet. And it's also, it's not just that it acts alive. Life happens where there's moisture. And it doesn't happen, like, where there isn't moisture. And we... See, like it's one of very a few substances where we see all three of its phases in kind of like the normal everyday lives of humans. You go up to the top of the mountain, ah, there's solid water. We can, it's ice, right? You go down to the sea, oh, it's liquid. You boil a pot of water. You see it turn into a gas. Yeah, okay. Uh, all right. I see where you're coming from. He's got reasons here. It's not just because the oracle said so. It's not just because I ate that plant and I had a vision and that's what the gods told me. He's got some reasons. How plausible is his explanation here? For the time, really good. For the time, remarkable, maybe, yeah. Everything's water, and we're like, well, not everything, but a lot. A lot is, yeah, you're right. A lot is a surprisingly large amount is water. Is it the fundamental arche? Is it the fundamental organizing principle of all things? Uh, like biologically. Biologically, perhaps, yeah. But, um, the sun and the stars, water, fire, maybe. Is fire water? No. I'm not sure exactly how hip Thales was to this, but I don't know. Have you ever, like, what is a fire? All the chemists in the room. What's... Yeah, okay. Combustion. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> yeah, fire is hot. And as far as the chemists are concerned, it's combustion. And what are the two products of every complete combustion? Oxygen. No. It eats oxygen, and it produces carbon dioxide and? Water. Water. 
Anytime you make a fire, like water is being produced. So I don't know if Thales knew that. In fact, fire seems like it's a weird outlier for him in trying to explain everything, but maybe the tools might have been there for him. This kind of gets us into some territory where we're like, we're not sure exactly what Thales said or how he would have responded to our question about like, what do you do about fire there, bro? Like, have you done this experiment? Do you know that fire produces water? That's really, really interesting. Folks won't know that combustion is turning a hydrocarbon by combining it with oxygen into carbon dioxide and water. They're, they're not going to know that for a long, long time. There's going to be a whole wacky phlogiston theory before we can get to that <coughs> theory of oxidation. But um, he's articulating a fundamental organizing principle, and he's reducing it to just one thing, one material thing. If we recognize that everything is made out of water, then the world will be predictable. It will be wet. Well, less, you know. It'll be moist. And the world is moist. In fact, when we look for habitable planets, what's the one thing we're always looking for? Is there water? Yeah. All right. That's Thales. Remarkable for his time. Remarkable for his time is a very polite way of saying stupid, though, right? <laughs> or uninteresting to us today. What do you think about this project to try to figure out one thing that everything is made of? Like, does that even seem plausible? Is that like an old fashioned idea or are we still thinking like, is this question like, what's everything made of? Is this still a question that resonates for us? And do we still try to come up with like, just one thing? Yeah. I mean, you can kind of look at these things like <clears throat> the atomists before Adam Discovered. Yeah, and, and we'll study the atomists. There, yeah. we got another hundred or so years, but yeah. 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 And so, the, just the fact that they're trying to find like, one building block is interesting in and of itself because we didn't find out about the atomists until like hundreds of years. And here's another interesting thing here: Thales, not an atomist. In fact, none of the Milesians were atomists just yet. So when I talk about a fundamental thing, and we we think in the terms of building blocks. That's not really quite how they're thinking. They're not thinking of like water molecules as Legos that we build everything, like the Legos that the world is built from. It's water is still, it's a continuous substance for Thales. The same way that it appears to all of like, I don't, when you drink a glass of water, are you usually thinking about the billions and billions of molecules rolling around each other or is it it's just, a, it's just a wet continuous substance? How do you think of water? And I'm not talking about like, oh, well, when I really think about it, like, just like your naive impression of water. Is it made of atoms? Is it continuous? It's just a thing? One thing. I mean, if you have a glass of water, you're not going to be like, I have a glass of a lot of water. Yeah, I have some waters. No, no, nobody says that. I have a water. I have a beer. I have many beers, but many beers is not like the glass of, it's not the glass of beer, it's like one beer, two beer, many beers, right? Yeah. All right. That's our friend Thales. Anaximander is one of his younger overlapping contemporaries. And Anax Anaximander, like Thales before him, did some really impressive stuff that we typically don't talk about in terms of philosophical contributions, but he was a wise guy and like really impressive. He did a, an awful lot of like really big stuff in geometry. If you get into the history of geometry, especially history of Greek geometry, Anaximander's a really big figure. He, um, whereas Thales predicted a solar eclipse, Anaximander determines exactly when the vernal and autumnal equinoxes are. That's actually a really difficult thing to do. It's relatively easy to figure out when the summer and winter solstices are. You just kind of put a stick in the ground, called a, no, a gnomon, and when the sun is up, it casts a shadow, and as the sun moves, the shadow gets longer and shorter, and the shadow moves. And all you got to do is kind of pay attention to those shadows, and at noon is when the shadow is going to be the shortest, and at the, let me see if, make sure I get this right. Yes, at the um, summer solstice, it's gonna be the shortest of the shortest, like the shortest noontime shadow. And at the um, winter solstice, it's the longest noontime shadow. Relatively easy to figure out exactly which day is the longest and the shortest day of the year. You gotta do this plus a lot of really fancy geometry to figure out 
which are the days where the sun, where the, the day and the night are exactly equal. And I know you might be thinking to yourself, like, how hard is it to figure out which, like, when is, like, the night exactly the same length as the day? You just, you just time it on your stopwatch, right? No. Not, not 600 BCE, you couldn't. Measuring time is not a thing that's going to happen for a very, very long time. As a matter of fact, it's like not until like well into the modern era are we going to have reliable standards of time for scientists to use. So this is a, like there's a whole lot of remarkable ingenuity going on with these folks as they're putting into practice this idea of like finding an arche and moving from mythos to logos. We're going to figure the world out. We believe that it's understandable. We believe that it's predictable. We believe that it's not just a big mystery and we're at the whim of the gods. For Anaximander, everything is, everything is, everything is, a payron. The infinite, perhaps? Yeah, that's, that's, so yeah. Welcome to our, how many do we have here? How many words have we racked up where I'm kind of like, we're not sure exactly what it means. It's a mushy term. We had, well, philosophy, that's the first one, right? What the heck is that? And then uh, Sophia itself, wisdom, was something that we were like, well, yeah, not, we can kind of sort of sketch out, but I don't know if I know exactly what it is. Logos gets tossed into the mix today. Um, RK. And now, a Peron. Which sometimes folks will say as the infinite. Literally, indefinite, I think, is maybe closer. Unlimited. And it comes from, like, we can break it down into its, its etymological parts here. We've got an alpha privative, ah, like, um, like atheist or asexual or, um, you get the idea, right? Like that, that privative a prefix, and then peron, which means a limit or a boundary. If you think of, um, what, do you call, what do you call the, if you trace the outside edge of a circle, what do we call that? Perimeter, perimeter right? Yeah, and not just a circle, any, yeah, any shape. The outside, if we trace the outside, we call it the perimeter. Yes, we do call it the circumference as well. The circumference is the length of the perimeter, right? Okay. And also the circum circumference isn't, yeah, it's not anywhere in the word a, a peron. But perimeter, right, peros is a limit, a boundary. Everything is, everything is, everything is the infinite. Infinite. Everything is the unlimited. That This is the, ah, oh, all, right, all right, I see where this is coming from here. The stuff that everything is made out of. The RK, the fundamental organizing principle is this unlimited stuff. Unformed matter, right? Unlimited matter, perhaps. We might think of it. It's, it's out of the indefinite. Things are, we put boundaries around them. You can think of it like this. First, there was this. <coughs> indefinite stuff. Then somebody took a little corner of it out and said like, here, I'll put a boundary around this. Now it's a thing. Yeah, it's a square thing. Yeah, it's a square. It, becomes, it only becomes a thing when we put some boundary. Do you know any things that don't have limits? This is a thing. Does it have limits? Yeah, like right around there. Like that. Yeah, there's lim it's got a boundary, right? The unlimited. The unlimited. What a weird idea. How about? Oh, I was just thinking like mathematical. Mathematical infinity? That seems to not be quite what he means just yet. And we'll talk in a little bit about like why I think that might not be the direction that he's going in. Some of it has to do with the fact that the Milesians are usually regarded as kind of all sharing some certain assumptions. One of the big assumptions that the Milesians all shared was there's one RK. There's a fundamental, there's like one single RK. This is the reason why we think of them as monists. 
They are monists because they think that there is one fundamental organizing principle. For Thales, it's water. For Anaximander, it's the apeiron, the indefinite or the unlimited. Interesting thing here. Can you see the apeiron? Can you taste it? Can you touch it? I don't think so. There's a, there's a kind of a weirdness to this idea. I'm not sure if it's... The water is like a very tangible, definite thing, right? The peron, by its nature, by definition. By definition? By, the de by definition, it's indefinite? Sounds about right. Can you know the indefinite? Describe the indefinite to me. Define the indefinite. It can't be done, right? Defined by a lack of definition. Defined by lack of definition? But then I just defined it now, didn't I? How indefinite could it possibly be? Well, it's, um, it's a tautological definition, so it's not that helpful anyway. It's not what, anyway? It's not helpful. That's a tautological definition. I'm just using the words in a different order. Neil, why don't you pass the microphone over? So just one more time for the folks at home. So it's okay to define the indefinite as undefinable. Yes. Because it's tautological. What do you mean by tautological for those who, for whom that might be a, a new word? Um, when you use a word to define itself or like, um, like, a, like an equivalence or, or a, like a mathematical identity, yeah. you, you don't really progress any understanding of the subject by like saying two equals two. Right. I mean, it's a true statement, but it doesn't mean anything. But what about two equals one plus one? Is that a tautology as well? It's, it's a more meaningful tautology, but it's also a, a mathematical statement. Yeah. In logic, usually we talk about tautologies as things that are necessarily true. All, we don't even need to know what the terms mean. We can just analyze its structure and we'll know that it's tautologous. So uh, yeah, ta all tautologies are tautologies. There's a nice XKCD comic. The first rule of tautology club is the first rule of tautology club. Um, typically, we use it as a kind of a, oh, that's an uninteresting truth when we talk about tautologies. Some of them are a little more interesting. So what do we think of if it's true that we're going to say the indefinite is definable as undefined? Is that an interesting tautology? If I would say it's philosophically interesting, but it doesn't get us very far on its own. Why is it? Oh, I think you just gave like a backhanded compliment to philosophy. Yeah, it's it's good for philosophy, but not really interesting all by itself. So, what do you what do you mean by this? Uh, if if you don't mind, I'll I'll keep pressing because this is this is fun. Um, so, uh, everybody okay over there? I had like a rubber band blow up. All right. So, um, what makes it philosophically interesting then? If we, if we have to, like, gin up some form, like, it's not genuinely interesting, only philosophically interesting. But if I was interested in philosophical things, say if I was a philosopher, or an aspiring philosopher, or just somebody in a philosophy class, what's interesting about saying that the indefinite is definable as undefined? Is it because it seems... Mysterious, right? Possibly self-contradictory? <clears throat> That's a cool little moment because it's... Notice what happens. It sucks you in, right? Like it, there's a kind of... You're like hearing, Daly says everything's water. All right, I get it. And then I like... Did you feel like something pull? That's like a metaphor. Did you feel something pull when we moved from Thales to Anaximander? Everything's water. Why? Because then I'm explaining it. You're like, all right, I see where he's coming from. And then Anaximander says the apparent is the, all of these things. It's defined as the fundamental arche, the order of all things, is that it's undefinable. Suddenly we're just like, ooh, that's a, that's a riddle. You have to pick it up and kind of look at it a little bit. You don't just walk by and be like, yeah, that's Thales, everything's water. Now we get this thing that's a puzzle. When we get to Heraclitus, we'll get like hella puzzles. He, that guy is like Mr. Puzzles. <laughs> Anaximander, everything's a payron. Anaximenes, everything is air. air. Oh, what a disappointing step backwards. 
One of the things that Anaximenes, if we're going to include him in here, is, is adding to the conversation is now we've got a mechanism. It's not just that, like, oh, water can turn into everything like Thales says. Anaximenes says it does it by this process, by compression and rarefaction. When you compress air, it turns into water. Compress it even more, it turns into stone or earth, ice. If you take air and you rarefy it, you kind of stretch it out, that's when it turns into fire. And suddenly, actually, if we're thinking in atomistic terms, this is pretty close to our idea of phase changes today, right? Compression, rarefaction with some additional things, like strange things that are happening between solid and liquid. It's not always good. Like ice, in fact, is a, a great example of like how Anaximenes might have thought he was on the right track, but was precisely wrong, in fact, is that when you go from, where are we all familiar with this? Liquid water to solid water? Like usually the phase change, you actually have to expand a little bit to turn from water to ice. This is why ice floats. If that didn't happen, our oceans would be mostly frozen. Um, so everything's air and there's this process of compression and rarefaction and that's kind of close to our idea today, except that we still don't have an idea of atoms yet. All these Milesians are monists and they tend to be thought of as material monists. That it's the matter. It's some kind of material principle that is the fundamental arcade, that's the fundamental organizing principle of all things. Thales, it's water. Anaximenes, it's air. Anaximander, is it material? It could be. And it seems to be, this is kind of like how he's thinking of it, as a formless, formless matter, if that ever even makes sense. That's, you know, it's defined as the indefinite. That's a little puzzle and a riddle to kind of like think about while you're on the toilet. Uh, to, another one to kind of like mull over is this question of, um, is it material? Is unformed matter, is it matter? Is that, is that like a sensible idea at all? Matter with no form at all? Matter before it has form. Can you even have unformed matter? We'll, we'll, we'll hit that one head on when we get to Aristotle, this question about what is the relationship between matter and form or material and form. Um, that's our time. No, that's not our time. Tuesday, Thursday classes go longer. There's just a lot of people talking outside. Okay. For a second there, I was like, shit, I'm way behind. This is the Milesians. Do we understand why people usually refer to them as material monists? What's the monist part mean? One principle. Just one, yeah, one RK. Yeah. And what's the material part? It's matter. It's all material. It's all, all matter. And if I ask like a short essay question to explain like, tell me why it is that Anaximander is maybe like a questionable fit for the, ter for the label of material monist. Do you think you could explain like why this is dicey and possibly why I would like why somebody might go either way? Like say like actually I don't think an act commander should count as a material monist, or I think that he should. Yes. You could do that? Yeah. Maybe think about it a little more. That's a that's totally the kind of exam question that I would ask. Yeah. Yes. How he is a material monist. Yeah. So in order for him to, so do, we get, do we get why he's a monist? It is, it's one thing. Yeah, everything is, like, everything is, if the way that you finish that sentence is, like, to talk about one thing, you're going to be a monist. Why is he material? Is that the part that's sticky for you? The one thing is, yeah, it's the aperon, right? That which is without peros, the, that, which was that, that which is without limit. And we've got to think of that in a way where we're thinking of like, that's stuff. It's the stuff that reality is made out of. Fundamentally, all of the reality is that stuff. But we're talking about it in its completely unformed, not yet anything stuffness. And it's material stuff. If this is a confusing idea for you, you're not necessarily alone. There are plenty of philosophers, and like I said, when we get to Aristotle, Aristotle will be like, that don't make sense at all. Like, how could there be, stu like, how could there be stuff without form? It's got to have some form, even if it's like a blobby form. Yes? Something that 
help me kind of that sort of make sense of that is thinking of it like algebra. Or is uh, Thales and, uh, and can we can we pass you a microphone? Thanks. So okay. we're thinking of it, we're, we should perhaps think of it like algebra. Like a mathematical infinity? Kind of, well, uh, not so much that, but um, whereas the other two guys would use an actual number, uh, an axiomander was just saying x instead of 5 or 2. Okay, so yeah, everything is, so we might think everything is made of 5s, which is like, what about, the, what about 1? But like, yeah, we could say something like, everything is made of 1s, everything is made of 2s, and then it's like an axiomander saying everything is number. Yeah. Which we might say, well, one of the things that we might identify here is that the confusion might be because I'm thinking of material and abstraction as somehow like incompatible. That there is a, there's a move towards the abstract for an axiomander. And this is like one of the ways where we might kind of be like, ooh, something weird's going on there. Something distinctly philosophical is going on there. These look like they're maybe proto scientific. And this one looks maybe proto-philosophical, if not genuinely philosophical. And one of the things we've got to keep in mind here is that like, there's no division between the two yet. There's like science is being born. And it won't really come into its own until, I don't know, what, 1500s? Bacon? Somebody like that? Like, we won't, science won't fully hit its stride. No one's going to use the word scientist until like the late 1800s. In fact, science as we know today, natural science was known for the longest time and at this time as natural philosophy. So the two are not quite distinct, but we can already see like two differing trajectories here. Like a movement towards the concrete as an RK of the cosmos. Some kind of concrete material stuff. And here we have an abstract sense of materiality. Maybe like the abstraction of material. Maybe this is what m the material of matter in its most abstract form is this. This might be what he's thinking of. So that might, I don't know, does that help kind of clear it up? It's the abstract form of formless matter. Ah, shit, now we're back into like little paradoxes again. Yeah. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to add was kind of about uh, where Anax, uh, Anaximander was coming from and Aperon. I don't know how to compare Greece of this time frame with China of this time frame, but I think there's some really interesting similarities between what he's saying in Greece and what Lao Tse is saying in China, yeah. uh, the way that cannot be named is not the true way. Yes. And later Cohen's. Um, I think part of the, well, one of the things about Aperon is the fact that its definition contradicts itself illustrates a lot of what Aperon is. That Aperon uh, is what? It's inherently contradictory? It, right. Like contradiction comes along with it? We're getting shades of Heraclitus already, and I want to, like, I, if there's a reason why I'm not indulging this thought process right now, it's because we're going to hit it in a really, really big way at our next meeting with uh, another guy who embraces that. Part of the reason why I'm not, I'm kind of like, I'm not sure exactly what an Aximander would have said about this. Is there something inherently self-contradictory? Is there something inherently paradoxical about the idea of a Peron? Um... It's because we only have like a couple of little fragments. We don't have a whole lot from Anaximander. Most of it's second hand. Um, there's a nice little quote here that adds one more thing that Anaximander was able to add into the conversation. Um, and it's the only surviving fragment that we have. You had a question though. Yeah. Yeah. Have you ever considered Anaximander not actually fully grasping the concept of infinity? Have I ever considered Anaximander not fully grasping the concept of infinity? Oh, uh, yes. Uh, Anaximenes. Yeah, that guy. No, say uh, it. Say it. Anaximenes. <laughs> One more time. Anaximenes? Clo much closer. Anaximenes? I cannot say that. <laughs> Let's try it all together. One, and it's Anaximenes. One, two, three. Anaximenes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's great. Um, it's worth it to practice it to say the word. So the question, uh, your question was, is it possible that he's not understanding 
fully understanding the concept of a payron. Um, I wouldn't say that, and for a couple of reasons. One, I'm not sure if I fully understand the concept of a payron, so I don't know if I'm in a position to say who is and who isn't. A little Socratic move right there. Another reason is because I'm not sure exactly what Anaximander thought of the Aperon, because we only get a few surviving fragments and second and third hand accounts of what it is that he said. So I can't say, that's a, that's a really, really tough question to answer. Um, has he introduced an idea that inherently like, demands to be picked up and examined and kind of like played with a little bit? I think, yeah, definitely that. And we can do interesting little geometrical pro projections, too, to think about this. The surface of the Earth is infinite. Like, well, what do you mean? Like, well, if you just, like, pick a direction and walk, you'll never get to the end. It's, like, completely, there, there's no paros. You'll not encounter anything. We're like, eh, but there's a surface area, right? There's definitely some limit. You're like, oh, you have to think at a higher dimension there. And so maybe this is, like, the direction that we go when we start thinking about the universe as being infinite as well. Um, obviously, though, still a concept that's rattling around in our philosophical consciousness, right? We still wonder whether or not the universe is infinite and how to think about that. One of the other things that Anaximander added to this conversation was this idea, and this is, ah, right, false started a couple of times there. And this is the content of the only surviving fragment that we're pretty sure like, came from him. And it comes by way of Simplicius in the 5th century. Um, it says, Whence things have their origin, there their destruction happens as it is ordained, according to the debt. For they give justice and compensation to one another for their injustice according to the ordering of time. What he's saying here is, when things come from the Aperon, there's a debt to be paid. How do we pay that debt? Going back to it. Got to put it back. Right? It's got to go back to the Aperon. Things die. Things that, come out of, things that come into form, things that come into being, also pass away. They decay. There's destruction. There's creation and there's destruction. And that creation and destruction is this coming out of and going back into the Aperon, the indefinite, the infinite. And that's justice. We ha that's a concept that hasn't made an appearance yet at all, right? That somehow justice is involved. It's a really thin sense of justice. And he says, katata crayon, according to the debt. It's not, he's not talking about justice itself. Like, the personified justice and the word that like, uh, Plato is going to pick up when he talks about justice in the, in the Republic is DK. So we have, according to crayon, according to the debt, some, uh, maybe we need some scare quotes around this. But something looking like justice has worked into the conversation now as well. Yes. Yes. Right. Right. The question, in case it didn't get picked up on the microphone, is how can we say that the indefinite is in fact unlimited if things can come into and out of it? Same as we might say, like, if the universe is infinite, what's outside of the universe? But then it's not infinite, right? Then there's a boundary. There's a boundary between this universe and another universe. We might say, eh, there's no, it, there's, it doesn't make sense. But we're kind of stuck with this idea of coming into and out of the infinite, right, or the indefinite. And one way of thinking about it is that it's not, that thinking about it as a physical movement into and out of might be a little bit of a metaphor and shouldn't be taken literally, that it's more like there's indefiniteness and then pff, like we form things out of it and then we destroy them. When you destroy something, kind of like when a person dies, right? When they return to the infinite, did they go somewhere? Is it like a change of location that happens when you die? before you were infinite, then you became a particular finite thing, and then you died and went back to the infinite. No longer a finite. 
we had shades of Heraclitus before. We're getting shades of Parmenides now. So, like, I'm going to table this because we're dealing with fragmentary comments and we're spinning the next couple of steps already out of them. Good. You guys are, you guys are good. Like, you're, you're making approximately 100 years of philosophical progress in one hour. I like it. <laughs> okay. Got to get at least one more guy on the table, and he is Pythagoras. Pythagoras and the Pythagoreans. Pythagoras is rumored to have studied with Anaximander, and part of that is because he grew up in Samos here, a little island just off the coast of Crete, and then eventually moved all the way over here to Croton. Part of the reason why he moved there was because he had founded a religion, a cult, a cult, a cult. He had founded a cult the Pythagorean cult, which was kind of like a religion, kind of like a bunch of other stuff. Like, we'll see some stuff with Pythagoras where we're like, this seems like a movement right back into the mythos, man. Like, the next philosopher is a cult leader? Give me a break. But, like, it's a cult of mathematics, which is a weird cult, right? You, like, it's not what you usually think of when you think of a cult. So, Pythagoras and, the, and they were, like, they were not very popular, like most cults are. Like, the other folks around them are kind of like, mm, weirdos, and they go to Croton mostly to escape persecution. Um, so, what's going on with Pythagoras and the Pythagoreans? Here are some of the things that they believed in their community. Um, they believed that the soul was immortal, and that when the body dies, the soul lives on. Not the craziest thing I ever heard. They believed that um, you shouldn't eat animals because they might be a reincarnated friend or relative. They believed that you shouldn't eat beans. They believed in gender equality. That was a really big deal at the time. Like, not, There wasn't a whole lot of that going on. <coughs> Not just in Greece and Asia Minor, but like anywhere on the planet, there wasn't a whole lot of gender equality. <clears throat> and we can start to see how some of these things go together, right? If you think that the soul is something that's distinct from an abstract thing, not a material thing. This is like one of the big moves that we get with Pythagoras and the Pythagoreans is this huge shift towards the abstract, towards something that is definitely not mathematical. Maybe we got some hints at it all already from Anaximander, but like... Pythagoras and Pythagoreans are making a huge shift away from the material and say, like, no, 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 you are not your body. You are some other immaterial thing, and when your body dies, that lives on, and eventually will be reincarnated in another body. And this is why we don't eat animals, and this is perhaps why we don't eat beans. We were like, why not beans? And, like, if you eat a whole bunch of beans, they'll start speaking through you. Like, there's, some, there's a life force going on there. This is the sort of thing, like, we got, got little shades of this also with Thales, too. Thales was fascinated with magnets and said, like, ah, some kind of, like, interesting principle involving water, of course, is going on inside of a magnet and leads him to say uh, a very famous quote from Thales, everything is full of gods. Not, not in the sense that there are, like, little Greek gods inside the magnet, like, doing stuff, but that... What we think of as gods, this fundamental organizing principle, is something that's suffused through everything. And it's what makes things move. When you see something move, you're like, where'd that come from? Like, what made that happen? Some natural force. Something that has got to be part of the fundamental organizing principle. All is full of gods. And beans, of course, obviously. Full of spirits. That's why you fart. That's why, thanks. I was trying to be yeah. delicate about it, but yeah, that's why you fart. Yep. Yeah. Um, so... Little that's actually not why, I'm sorry, just, that's actually not why you fart, but yeah, right. <laughs> so, so they didn't eat animals because they might be reincarnated people, and then you used the second sentence and the same breath to say that they believed in gender equality and didn't eat beans. Are those related? Oh, yes. Well, they believed in bean. They, belie they didn't eat beans. Um, hard to tell exactly why, because we just have a list of rules, and you're like, where does that come from? It might just be inconsiderate to your fellow cult members to eat beans. It might be because we think that beans are like different than your ordinary vegetable in that they contain a soul or a spirit. Anaximenes said that everything is air, and we might think of like 
Air seems like such a, like an inferior principle to even something like water, like Thaley says. After all, water and moisture is what gives life to everything. Why not air, right? Why not air be our principle? Because it's, it's breath, right? Like, it's spiritus. It, all through the Middle Ages, we're going to talk about the soul as spirit, as breath. And so that's, yeah, yeah, sure, why not with Anaximenes as, as well? And we can say the same thing about beans, that it's a sign that there's a soul in that bean. That it talks. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I'm, I'm trying my best to like, think, like, what would a Pythagorean say? Gender equality is one that totally makes sense because if you are not your body, then these presumably superficial bodily distinctions between men and women are not important. If you're just a soul, man, woman, all the same kind of soul. Not everybody ends up agreeing with that, but usually it ends up... Uh, not all the Pythagoreans seem to, at least. And uh, gender equality and this idea of the soul is going to be something that's rattling around the rest of our conversation about Greek philosophy. Pythagoras and the Pythagoreans are a huge influence on Plato. After Socrates dies, he goes to Croton and spends like quite a bit of time studying with the Pythagoreans, and it's it's a, a big influence on his work. Well, as we go through it, we'll point out like there it is. There's Pythagoreanism. Everything is, everything is, water, aperon, air, everything is mathematical ratios. Because that is the tippy-top pinnacle. That's as abstract as you get, man, is mathematical ratio. And the story of how Pythagoras discovers this, and there's no telling whether it's a true story or apocryphal, is that he was walking through, um, he was walking through the, the village and he heard blacksmiths banging on their anvils, and he noticed that they were, like, they were playing like a little tune. It was like, bunk, 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 And he was like, that's cool. And he goes over and he looks at the anvils and he realizes that this one that's like an octave higher than this one is half as big as this one. And this one that's like an intermediary interval between this one and this one, it's an intermediary mathematical like whole number. Like its size is kind of doing the same sort of thing as the sound. And suddenly he just, there's kind of, he thinks to like, and this is how flutes work as well. And he realizes that mathematical ratio is, first of all, it's how we understand the world around us. Second of all, it unites things like, like a, a kind of what we might think of as a cold scientific description of like how the world is. That mathematics is like the language of like the book of nature. This is, this is what's going to be said about it in early modernity. We'll start thinking about math. And we think about it like that now, right? Do we all? Do physicists at least? Physicists seem to think of like, well, what is the world like? Or at least how is it describable? It's describable in terms of mathematical ratios. Pythagoras got there early. 500s BCE was talking about how everything was made of mathematical ratios and not just everything in the natural world around us, but beauty and ugliness can be described this way as well. So suddenly we have this notion of value. We had something about justice before with Anaximander, this idea of like kata ta crayon, according to the debt, that which comes out of the apeiron has got to go back someday. Um, with Pythagoras, we have something more like beauty. And also, they start playing around with this idea of harmony as more than just a metaphor for how we get along with one another in a community. So justice, maybe even in a stronger sense than the payment of debt, or in a slightly different sense than the payment of debt, justice in the sense of harmony is somehow describable by mathematical ratio as well, unspecified exactly how we're going to flesh that out. But beauty, mathematics, justice, all part of the same thing. It's all harmony. It's all math and harmony is nothing more than mathematical ratio. That's as abstract as, it seems like maybe it's as abstract as you could get. Number. Number's pretty abstract, right? Quite a movement in less than 100 years from 
Because the gods were angry to, hey, I think the world is describable in mathematical terms. Remarkable. And done without any of the tools. Like there were some experimental things that went on here. Thales, maybe in making some of his predictions, looked a little scientific. Anaximander is credited as having made the first scientific experiment, famously by um, the late uh, scientific popularizer Carl Sagan, said that like, the very first scientific experiment was Anaximander figuring out when the equinoxes were. But something else is going on as well, and I'll kind of draw our attention to it. This is kind of like philosophy emerging out of this, is that it's an engagement with nothing but the tools that we have in our minds, with nothing but mathematical ratio, rationality, no accident that those two words contain the same roots. Ratio and rationality is a Latin root. Sometimes it, uh, in early Latin uses of ratio and rationality, what we're talking about is math literal mathematical ratio. Sometimes it takes on the flavor of whether or not things can talk to one another, whether or not they're speaking the same language. Language. Ratio. Logos, right, is language, giving an account, speaking. There's something about this idea of the orderliness of concepts and the way that we communicate ourselves through language, not just to ourselves, but to others as well, in an orderly way so others can understand us. And this is this new path that's coming out of mythos. And this is the beginning of philosophy. So the story says, right? Who knows? Perhaps it started someplace else. Perhaps it was Lao Tzu in China. Perhaps it was... Pythagoras is, and this is a fruitful time all over the globe. While Pythagoras is working, we've got Confucius doing his thing in China. We've got uh, Siddhartha Gautama finding enlightenment, becoming the Buddha. It's a spooky. There's like something in the air. You guys are fidgeting, which means we're done? Is that, wait, 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 it was a question, not a statement. Any questions? Yes. Can you go, well, yeah, I'm about to dismiss the whole class, so yeah, totally. And for future reference, um, you don't ever have to ask if you need to use the restroom. That goes for you guys at home as well. Just pause it and get up and go. All right. Talk to you guys later. Have a good one. Uh, keep your eyes peeled for a new reading assignment. Although we didn't get to Xenophanes, we're going to start talking about him and Heraclitus at our next meeting. <laughs>